our next speaker is uh, the, uh, Professor Sui Yuan from the Institute for Systems Biology, and he will speak about the computational approaches for system level data collection. Uh, welcome, Sui, and the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. So you just heard the title that was imposed to me for this uh, session. I actually want to be more specific and just talk about systems level approaches to data collection. So I'd like to give you some theoretical aspect and how theory and system thinking motivated the way we collect data. And that really resonates with what we, the two talks you, you've just heard. So I'm going to talk about systems dynamics of cell state transitions and why it is relevant for regenerative medicine and focus on single cell transcriptomics, show some data there. So uh, I think everything, everybody wants to reprogram cells from one cell type to another, you've just heard from Peter's talk. And so the vision is to do that under some manipulation. And for example, going from iPSC cells to a neuron or some pancreas alpha cells to beta cells that are useful for diabetes treatment. So that's what we want to do. And in reality, it's more complicated because we are multicellular organisms. So cells are like herding cats. They just go in all the directions that you want. And that's a major problem because we are poised to generate many cell types. So what we need is a systems view to understand that what happens is not just what we want, but also something else that nature wants. So now I'd like to show you how we should change our thinking and that you've heard a bit from Peter about system thinking and from Bill's talk. So we have to move away from this reductionist traditional thinking where we just say, you know, there are mechanistic pathways like a protein A causes an effect B or a phenotype. That's a traditional molecular by thinking. And then if we want to achieve B, we just stimulate protein A by overexpressing it, or we want to block the effect B. So we, we just inhibit that protein A. That's a classical, uh, what we call linear molecular causation-based thinking in much of biology. And a system thinking, I think, would be different. So this would be not appropriate way, but just think of cell states as a whole holistic entity. And we want to move a cell from state A, could be any cell type, to a state B. And the uh, manipulation is to trigger that transition. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we need to define what is a cell state of a cell. And that's, as you all can appreciate, is governed by the gene regulatory network that we also have heard. So that's a network that has evolved to generate a cell state or a cell type. And these are the genes. Now these red dots, individual genes. And collectively, they govern a gene expression profile, the transcriptome across the entire genome, meaning that every gene has some level of expression, and they are not interdependent. They're not independent, they're interdependent. And uh, if you change the state, then the gene expression profile changes, but all dictated by the network, right? You cannot violate the interactions. If, for example, these genes here goes down, then these genes here, which is downstream, also goes down. And so what changes is not a network. Many people think, oh, we have a liver network, we have a stem cell network. I think that's not correct. The network is hardwired. What changes is the state defined by the profile of the expression level of individual genes. So we can express this as a high dimensional vector, state A and state B for one to M genes could be 10,000. And we used to display this as this self-organizing map as just a visual representation of a gene expression profile. So now we know that the interdependence of genes can be written down mathematically. I'm not going into the details. It's an ODE that tells you what happens if genes goes up and this has to go down and so on. And even with more theory, I think it's justified to view this particular state as points in some landscape in which uh, you have these stable attractor states, which tells you that a particular configuration of activation of genes makes sense and complies well with the network. So it's a stable state that is observable. And the point is to appreciate that these complicated networks generate multiple of these attractive states, which are then lead to what is called multi-stability. And so the key idea that many people have since the 40s, 
is then that we were interested in transitions, but Waddington already tried to uh, frame development as a process that takes place in these landscapes where natural states are being sought after by the network and that gives rise to the robustness of development. So that's a basic conceptual idea that I think we should also use for regenerative medicine. Now the complications to that need a picture and that is of course, we are multicellular organisms so we have to deal with many cells. Every time we try to uh, reprogram cells we have uh, millions of cells and they're all slightly different uh, because of stochastic fluctuations. So we have what we now call non-genetic heterogeneity. Uh, and uh, we've heard also about that in, in, in Bill's the first talk. So uh, now enter single cell transcriptomics, which precisely allows us to gain a, a bit a better view of these individual cells. So this is one example that I will discuss later. So every point here in this reduced dimensional space is a cell. It's, and they're slightly different. You have different clusters and so on. I think many of you have seen those uh, plots. So that's a whole population of cells. And that somehow must be related to the theory that tells you there are only few or a finite number of allowed stable states. And both somehow come from gene regulatory network, which we have been spending you know, decades trying to figure out the wiring diagram. So now I'd like to briefly tell you what actually is new with single cell transcription. So in the traditional measurement, which would take a whole dish of a million cells and measure gene expression profile. I think many of you have done that. And then for example, you trigger differentiation and then you measure gene expression profile again, and the transcom changes. And you can model that and so on. But now if you have single cell resolution measurement, for example, these are individual cells, they form this histogram along just one gene, X1, so they're different. And we have shown that this type of distributions is not just measurement noise, but it's true distinctiveness of the cells. And then now we have a matrix in which every column is a cell and every row is a gene. Now we do the same thing, so we have much more information. If you perturb that to differentiate, suddenly the population structure changes. And what we want to learn is how this matrix then also changes accordingly. So we don't have this aggregate measure of just the gene expression profile. And so that's what is new with single cell resolution analysis. And now coming back to this picture here. So that's actually the second complication and that is that there's this spontaneous branching into various cell types. And, and that's really abstract. So I try to summarize that in a cartoon. So again, we seek to achieve cell state transitions from A to B all kinds of phenotypes, but in a nonlinear system, we have to consider that something else happens. And that is once we trigger a perturbation or you use a perturbation to trigger a change, the cell can split in different states. And they're very often at polar opposites. And this is a reason for that, uh, that we're only starting to understand. So we need to consider, and that's exactly what uh, Peter was talking about, uh, non-linear dynamics that give rise to multi-stability, to multiple attractor states, and heterogeneity, meaning that you have many, many instances of systems that, and they're noisy, and they can uh, implement these various states. So these are the two things to consider. Now, why is that? So just, this is now a cartoon, but there's a mass behind it. So you want to go from A to B, and you get C, which you don't want. And that can be understood in the following way. So I've talked about this landscape. Essentially, you want to go from this attracted state A to attracted state B. And there are many ways to model that. But we think one way, because of our measurement, you know, noise is too weak to trigger this jump. But what happens when you trigger a transition is you destabilize this attracted state first. And that leads to what is called a critical transition. So this attracted flattens. You can see the cells spread out. And then many cells will go into B as you want, but then you, you have this intermediate state, which is unstable. And here is where you lose control and some cells go into B, but a few would go into aberrant directions that you don't want, like this uh, undesired cell type C. 
So that's a problem of herding cats when we try to reprogram cells. And also, just so you know how to appreciate single cell data, these are individual cells. Their position in the state space is governed by this underlying landscape, which represents the constraints from the gene regulatory network. And that is exactly what you see when you look at the single cell data. I think many of you have seen those now. Uh, so just remember that if you find these stable clusters, they are the manifestation of constraints of which states are more stable and which are not. So the cluster reflects the dynamics on that epigenetic landscape. So uh, yeah, so why do then cells split into these states? And we had work a little bit in more details on that. I don't want to go into the math, but what you should appreciate is that once the state destabilizes, you, the cells disperse, they become more different. And so the correlation between the cells reduces. But what is also interesting is that the genes in this table would start to uh, correlate. So we have essentially, in summary, an ensemble of high dimensional systems, which are the cells. They form a population and they read out the landscape distortion if you have single resolution measurements and that will expose this destabilization. And what we predict is that before this critical transition, you have a correlation of the cell will decrease and the correlation between the genes will increase. And one can also understand it in a more uh, intuitive way. And that is once when you have this transition, the correlation between cells disappears because they become more different. However, genes in attractor states, they are highly correlated. They're non-correlated because they're all the same and only driven by noise. And when you have this distortion of the landscape, cells move in one direction in lower dimensional direction into high dimensional state space and genes start to correlate. And so this index here would increase of the average gene-gene correlation and uh, over the cell-cell correlations. So that's something related to system thinking and this is such as a goal, so I think Claudia uh, proposed to us, but now I'd like to show you one specific example in the last three minutes. So we're trying to uh, differentiate iPS cells into cardiomyocytes. Many people try to do that, there are protocols to do that. And the path you have to take in this landscape is you have to undergo these branch points, and, but you lose cells because cells move to other directions. So you have a desired fate and undesired fate. And here's the data. So you can see that you move from this epiplast to this primitive streak state. And now just to show you that the theory can be shown, you have now two critical state transitions. You jump between well-recognizable stable state to another, and here you even have a split of cells. And so if you measure now cell-cell correlation, you can see that as you move towards this first jump, uh, the cell-cell correlation decreases. You see a lot of pairs of cell-cell correlation that flow correlation. However, in the same process, and this is a gene-by-gene uh, gene correlation matrix, and the color is a correlation, you see more and more pairs of genes that suddenly start to correlate. So very reminiscent of this correlation phenomena in critical transitions. And those genes that correlate are kind of important. And uh, in this uh, transition, uh, you can see an increase in this index for every one of these transitions. So that fits with the theoretical predictions. And you also have these undesired cells that appear, which in this case are the endodermal lineages, as opposed to the mesodermal lineage, which leads to the cardiomyocytes. And so we can also see now in these gene-gene correlation maps, in the attractor states, very little correlation between any pairs of genes. But as you move forward, you see suddenly correlations appear and based on which genes correlate with which one, you also can get the notion of who drives what. So uh, that's the idea in, in summary, back to system thinking. So we should be aware of this network that governs gene expression profile. We have a theory that tells you how individual states are more stable or less stable and uh, with many cells. In one population, we're interested in transitions. This is a typical flow cytometry, which essentially is just one dimension of this high dimensional dynamics. But now with single cell data, we have these high dimensional dynamic uh, states. And just to remind you, if you see this, now every single point is one configuration of the network and they're constrained by this landscape. So 
I think I'll stop here and uh, glad to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Sri. It was very fascinating, actually. As a matter of fact, I thought that was very simple explain of such a complexity uh, problem.